with unselfish hands. We harbor no fears. We have no sordid ends to serve. November the 2nd, no 1920. Contemplate or apprehend no conquest. On that day, Warren G. Harding was elected president. And on the same day, something calling itself Station KDKA in Pittsburgh began a schedule of radio broadcasting starting with election returns that has never been interrupted. This album set out to glance at what radio has been doing in the past 50 years and to take a look at what the next 50 might bring. I'm going to have a few words about the pioneer days and the health of Skelter pre-network years, of course. Jimmy Wallington, Henry Morgan, Gary Moore, and uh, Jack Bogart from KDKA will parade before your ears and imagination some of radio's best dramas, news, music, and some of the worst, too. If your favorite show is missing, well, let me just say that we have some very difficult choices to make. My name is Ben Brooks. I've been listening to radio for nearly 50 years, and I've been writing a radio and TV column for the New York Daily News since 1925. And when I started, you know, I certainly didn't believe that radio would ever sound like this. Portland. Well, Fred, we've enjoyed laughing at you so much over the radio. And now it's a pleasure to laugh in your face. Good evening, Mr. Mr. Now from South America and all the ships and clippers at sea. Let's go to Press Flash. Time marches on. No, 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 no. Not that door. That's the whole closet. No, no, no. I'm asking you who's on first. No, that's the man's name. That's whose name? Yes. Well, go ahead and tell me. Who? The guy in first. Who? First Who is on first? Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. I shall go to Korea. A strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. The very first radio transmission of Marconi and other electrical inventors were all in Morse code, as you probably know, until a great electrical genius invented a system that would receive and amplify a continuous radio wave that could be modulated by the human voice. It was a new tube, and the inventor was Dr. Lee DeForest. I knew him quite well, and he once told me about his first voice transmission. You see, he had been experimenting in his studio on Lower Park Avenue in New York City, and he had a listening post in Brooklyn and another one in Staten Island. Now, one evening in 1907, after a long day's work, he ran into an old friend at dinner. Her name was Eugenia Farrar, a concert singer, and he invited her up to his lab to make an experiment. He showed her the great big morning glory horn, which was attached to a primitive microphone, and she said, if I sing into this thing, you mean to tell me that they'll hear me all the way in Brooklyn? And he said, yes. Well, she said, here goes something into nothing. And then she started to sing a popular concert number that day. And pretty soon, the phone rang. It was a man in Brooklyn at the listening post, and he was all excited. And then a man in Staten Island called in. They both said that they had heard something like this.
Oh, but it wasn't too long after that that Dr. DeForest arranged a broadcast that was even of greater importance. A broadcast with the greatest tenor of his day, Enrico Caruso. And this came right from the stage of the Metropolitan Opera House in New York. Now, the next voice you're going to hear is that of Dr. Leader Forrest himself. Uh, this was when he spoke in 1939 at the New York World's Fair at a big dinner party in his honor. I remember as if it were yesterday, that summer afternoon in 1907, when music was first sent out by radio phone. In that same laboratory many months earlier, I conceived and tested the first three-electrode vacuum tube. In that same little laboratory, I had found that this grid tube, which is, we had recently christened the audience, would simply would amplify telephone currents. In 1907, when the idea of radio broadcasting first occurred, and again in 1910, when the voices of Metropolitan Opera singers Caruso and Martin were for the first time launched upon the ether, and again in 16, when for the first time regular radio concerts were maintained from my old station at Highbridge, in the Bronx, there continued to dawn a widening vision of the astonishing potentialities of the radio broadcast, which vision the last 19 years have been bringing more and more into reality. But I confess that in those pioneer days, my eager imagination fell far short of picturing the astonishing hold with which this idea so suddenly gripped our entire nation. I need not tell you that radio caught on quickly. The whole idea of a voice of music coming out of a box in a living room, even though you had to have earphones to hear it, that was fascinating. Oh, there were jokes about wireless, there were songs, and even vaudeville routines and phonograph records. You see, by that time, Radio was becoming important enough to be laughed at. Buddyman is now being attempted with wireless telephony from a ship 1,000 miles at sea to Marconi House. Is that so? Hello? Hello? What's that noise? SS President Lincoln speaking. You're a liar. President Lincoln is dead. SS Lincoln! SS Lincoln! SS Lincoln, what's the name, Mr. Lincoln? Your first name. He's at London. Cone, Cone. Yes, I'm Cone, Cone. Sam Cone. Hey, so who are you speaking from? Oh, that's one called Cone Listens In on the Wireless. And it fractured people around 1912. And about that time, Charles Harrell opened up a small college of electrical engineering in San Jose, and he began to transmit every Wednesday afternoon. And he must have done pretty well, because that station later on became KCBS in San Francisco. His assistant during all those broadcasts was his young bride, Mrs. Sybil Harold. Well, at that time, it was wireless, and we never heard the ring radio. It was, our, it was the wireless telephone, as they called it in those days. First, I remember, it was just uh, uh, the voice. What we was trying to do was to re improve the reception of the voice and the different uh, adjustments that would be made on the uh, instruments that uh, Mr. Harold had there. And finally, as it was improved and grew better each time that we worked on it, then finally we started broadcasting the music. And I really believe that I was the first woman to ever broadcast a program. On September the 5th, 1914, our first baby boy was born. Uh, and we have a picture of him where I'm holding up to him up to the transmitter, and he was just crying as hard as he could cry. But that was the thing we wanted, to see if that baby's cry could be transmitted to the Fairmont Hotel. Nobody lied when they said I most died over you. Nobody lied when they 
that is Miss Juan Delete as she sang in 1916, before her long radio career really began. Radio was catching on by now, but still the most reliable way to transmit the human voice was by parcel post, by means of recording. For example, in March of 1913, Theodore Roosevelt recorded the cylinder and sent it to the Boy Scouts rally in New York. In this way, I desire to greet the boys progressively at their meeting at the Hotel Manhattan. I feel that the progressive party should appeal peculiarly to the young men and therefore to the boys who are to be the next generation of voters. And during his first term, Woodrow Wilson also recorded a message, and he had it delivered to a gathering of American Indians. My brother, it gives me pleasure as President of the United States to send this greeting to you. There are some dark pages in the history of the white man's dealings with the Indians. The great white father now calls you his brother, not his children. Because you have shown in your education and in your settled ways of life, aren't manly, worthy qualities of sound character. Still, another recorded message was transmitted by General Pershing. He wanted to get the air of the folks back home. 3,000 miles from home, an American army is fighting for you. Everything you hold worthwhile is at stake. Only the hardest blows can win against the enemy we are fighting. Invoking the spirit of our forefathers. In January of 1919, President Wilson's 14 points were flashed to Europe in dots and dashes. And when he arrived there in person, he was already a hero. This is Morse code, and it comes from an instruction record, circa 1908. In 1912, the great ship Titanic struck an iceberg and sank. The names of the survivors were received by a brilliant young wireless operator for the Marconi Company. His name, David Sarnoff. Sarnoff got a lot of publicity, and his career with the Marconi Company and his successor, RCA, was assured. In 1916, by the way, he came up with some new thinking in radio. That instruction, music, information, and entertainment were all possible by wireless. Every home, he thought, should have a radio music box. And it was RCA, of course, that would build them. There's a great sensational wonder today, we know. Everyone is talking and fooling with radio. It's a wireless telephone, I just got one of my own. Now I sit at home alone and hear that dictator. That was a cylinder recording called Radio Foxtrot. Now, in the meantime, the Westinghouse Electric Corporation out in Pittsburgh was trying to perfect something called point-to-point -point broadcasting. And their idea was for people to talk to each other by wireless so that no one could listen in. But whenever they tried it, well, you've guessed it, everyone who had a receiver would tune in, just like a party line. One day, Mr. H.B. Davis a vice president of Westinghouse noticed a newspaper ad for receiving sets. It was inserted by a Pittsburgh department store, and the sets were priced ten dollars each. Now that started his thinking. Perhaps the future of radio lay in having the largest possible number of listeners, not the fewest. And in the meantime, Dr. Frank Conrad, who was the chief engineer at Westinghouse, had been experimenting with a transmitter in his garage. And he was the one who gave radio concerts which were mentioned in the newspaper ad. Between them, 
they decided to put Westinghouse in the broadcasting business. Now, this is the voice of Dr. Frank Conrad from a recording made some years before he died. Yeah, that was a hobby I carried out at home. In fact, it's one of those things where you uh, finally got deeper and deeper into it. I got to, uh, people would call me up at night and ask me to transmit. They want, uh, said they had some friends want to listen to something coming out of the air. I would transmit either talk or phonograph music or something like that. And they finally got to, uh, to, uh, take care of that I sort of arrange to send the program twice a week, every Wednesday and Saturday night. And that really started, uh, we might say, was the first first regular broadcasting. And of course, at that time, I actually had no idea what it was going to end up into. Maybe if I had no idea what they end up into, I'd stop. <laughs> but I think he thought it would be quite an industry. Why they were so mad at me when I said it wouldn't last. The real the start of KDK was due to the fact that some of the department stores in Pittsburgh began to, put, began to advertise radio sets, which would receive signals that, that came from my laboratory. Well, the similar company officials, including Mr. H. B. Davis, who saw those, he thought, "Well, here, that that looks like that's going to be a big, uh, a big commercial." Uh, and uh, so he said, "Now we better do this out here on a good scale." This little one-horse thing got down to the house wasn't well, enough. So uh, we had a station there, uh, K- uh, licensed as KDK. It was put up for the, for the purpose of transmitting from uh, East Pittsburgh to some of our other factories. Successor did that, so we converted that into a broadcasting station. This is KDKA of the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company in East Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We shall now broadcast the election returns. <coughs> we are receiving these returns through the cooperation the date was November the 2nd, 1920. And this was the inaugural broadcast of the station that is regarded as the first regularly scheduled non-experimental outlet. Also, it was a broadcast for the public, not just for electrical engineers with receivers and such. And it took radio out of the back pages into the front headlines. In short, Katie Key's first show was a sensation, and it sounded something like this. These returns through the cooperation and by special arrangements with the Pittsburgh Post and Sun. We'd appreciate it if anyone hearing this broadcast would communicate with us, as we are very anxious to know how far the broadcast is reaching and how it is being received. While we're waiting for the returns to come in over the telephone, direct from the Post and Sun, I'll give you the list of offices in today's presidential election. Here they are. Some 30 million Americans are electing a president of the United States, a vice president, 34 United States senators, 435 members of the House of Representatives, governors of 34 states, and thousands of minor offices, county judges, and officials. <coughs> Folks who didn't have receivers heard the returns at country clubs, parties, and even in theaters. It was a kind of a multimedia spectacular, you know, because people heard it at the movies. The first man who was hired for the sole purpose of announcing programs on KDK was Harold Arlen, A-R-L-I-N. He remembers how it was in the early months of 1921 when the station was on the air for two full hours every night of the week, except on Sunday. Our uh, first broadcasts really were not from a studio. They were from a tiny shack located on the roof of a six-story manufacturing building. We had a small room for the uh, transmitting apparatus and a still smaller room for the uh, phonograph equipment. We used this uh, arrangement through the winter. In the spring, we uh, moved to an auditorium in the manufacturing plant, but the acoustics there were not very good, so we went back to the roof and erected a tent, and we uh, broadcast from the tent. One night, uh, a storm came up and blew the tent off the roof. Uh, There went our uh, first radio studio. Following this, uh, we broadcast temporarily in the open air from the roof of the building, and uh, that reminds me of another incident.
In the spring and early summer, the moths and bugs would fly around the electric lamps that we used to light the roof. And one night, we had a tenor soloist on the program, and uh, while he was singing, he started to hit a high note, and he sucked a bug into his mouth, and he choked right in the middle of his song. About the uh, same time, we had a soprano soloist from Pittsburgh uh, who came out to East Pittsburgh. This uh, manufacturing building from which our open-air broadcasts were being made uh, was located right next to the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad. This uh, soprano soloist came out all dressed up in evening clothes. She looked beautiful. But right in the middle of her song, a Pennsylvania train went by and blew a great cloud of smoke and soot all over her hair, her face, and her dress. She just kept on singing through the smoke and soot and finally finished her song. Harold Arlen, who was KDK's first announcer, recalls that introducing celebrities was one of his very first duties. When I introduced Herbert Hoover, he was at the Duquesne Club in Pittsburgh uh, and uh, made a talk uh, soliciting funds for Belgian relief work. While the planets particularly aim to economic relief, yes, the economic relief means the swinging of men's minds from fear to confidence, the swinging of nations from the apprehension of disorder and of governmental collapse toward hope and confidence in the future. I uh, recall particularly uh, Will Rogers. Uh, he came into the Pittsburgh Post studio one evening and uh, picked up a copy of the Pittsburgh Sun and uh, talked for 15 minutes in a very humorous vein just from the headlines in the evening paper. Now, folks, all I know is just what little news I read every day in the papers. Everybody's talking about what's the matter with this country and what the country needs. What this country needs worse than anything else is a place to park your car. What our big cities need is another orange in these orange age stands. I introduced... Uh, William Jennings Bryan from the uh, pulpit of the Point Breeze Presbyterian Church. That the great cities are in favor of the gold standard. We reply that the great cities rest upon our broad and fertile prairies. Burn down your cities and leave our farms, and your cities will spring up again as if by magic. But destroy our farms, and the grass will grow in the streets of every city of the country. News station followed rapidly in one city after another. WBZ in Springfield, now in Boston, and KYW in Chicago, now in Philadelphia, both went on the air in 1921. The entire season in Chicago was opera. Just think of it. No sports, no popular music, no little lectures, just opera. Station WJZ in Newark was a success from the very start. As a matter of fact, Westinghouse started getting more phone calls about the programs than they did about their merchandise, which was radio receiving sets. I knew their first announcer at WJZ, Tommy Cowan, and he told me personally what he used to say on the air. This is the radio telephone broadcasting station of the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company located in Newark, New Jersey. We are talking to you now, ladies and gentlemen, with the idea that some of you out there can pick up our remarks. And if you do, please let us know. This is Announcer Cowan, Newark. And then he shortened it to, this is ACN. This is ACN. And for a long time, other announcers followed his lead and used just their initials on the air. Tommy Cowan, broadcast the first World Series game. It was on October the 5th, 1921. They put a man in a box at the polo grounds with an ordinary telephone, and he relayed the game to Tommy play by play. Tommy repeated it on the microphone. And do you know that when the game was over, Tommy didn't even know who had won, the Giants or the Yankees? Tommy Cowan was also responsible for the first broadcast by a band leader, Vincent Lopez. It was on a night when another show was canceled. 
November 26, 1921. We had to go up a rickety stairs to the studio, which was a, an old coat room, they tell me. And they had velour, red velour, and to batch the carpet, an upright piano that's seen the war, and a little few stands around, everything in a circle. We didn't know what it was all about. There's a microphone right in the center. So Tommy says, uh, tune up. So he tuned up. I said, uh, what are you going to play? I said, I don't know. We didn't make up any program. You said you wanted us to help you out. We're helping you out now. I said, well, play something. So I played Canadian capers. He said, now, say something. So I stepped down the podium. It's about a foot high and walked into the mic and said, hello, everybody. Lopez speaking. And right back to the microphone. I mean, to the band again. He said, is that all you're going to say? What else can I say? I said it again. Well, after that, we played and played and played. In those times, you could play for an hour or two hours. Time meant nothing. There was no program. Well, there was indeed a big rush to get on the air. Newspapers, department stores, electrical companies, furniture stores, even laundries and banks were getting broadcasting licenses. Actually, it was as easy as getting a marriage license. Now, this is Jack Popoli, the chief engineer for WR for many years. Now, I started with WR uh, in February 1922, uh, about the time when uh, Bamberger's received the license to broadcast, and this license was issued at that time by the Department of Commerce. We went to Washington in the morning, prepared an application for a wireless telephone license. We submitted it to the clerk. The clerk uh, filled out a, a license, and we came back in the afternoon with a license. We bought an old DeForest transmitter, and uh, we promptly put it on the air, and uh, on February the 22nd, 1922, was the inauguration date of WOR. As the months went by, radio stations and programs and staffs became a little more elaborate and began to cost their owners a bundle, you might say. But who would pay for it? Would it be the government, the states, or perhaps the listeners through some sort of a tax on receivers? The man in charge of radio broadcasting was the Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Hoover. It is inconceivable, he intoned that this great medium of culture and enlightenment and education should ever be used for the hawking of merchandise. Yes, that's what he said. Well, soon, a new station was founded, and businesses were invited to buy time to inform the public about their services. This was WEAF, and its owner was none other than AT&T. The first commercial advertised an apartment house, and it sounded sudden like this. Friends, you owe it to yourself and your family to leave the congested city and enjoy what nature intended you to enjoy. Visit our new apartment homes in Hawthorne Court, Jackson Heights, where you may enjoy community life in a friendly environment. Well, now the age of sponsors was upon us. For a little while, stations were uncertain about their advertising. And on one occasion, I can recall that actually time was paid for in cash under the table. You know, just like two bootleggers. And then they began to solicit sponsors right and left. But it was all very dignified, of course. No prices, no hard sell. Fast through a great war, an armed conflict which calls forth every resource, every effort on the part of the whole population. The war was won by Republicans as well as by Democrats. The war was brought to a successful conclusion by a glorious common effort, one which in the years to come will be a national pride. Franklin Roosevelt made that speech in Hyde Park in 1920. In 10 years, he would master radio like no one before or since. 